as a pediatric community, we know a lot about resilience to trauma. We've been studying this for a long, long time. And the number one predictor of resilience to a trauma is a kid having a meaningful connection to an adult. Jessica, welcome to the Generation Youth Podcast. Thank you for being my guest today. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I am really looking forward to this conversation. Well, I want to thank you again for being a part of our summit this past summer. And as as I told you before we started recording, I really, really do uh, have a lot of gratitude for you for being willing for me to reach out to you, Cole, because we never had met and right. and and responding so positively to it because it really enriched our summit. We had a lot of great feedback. I think yours was one of the more popular presentations that we had, or at least it was one of the most popular in my house. My wife has watched it multiple times and has stolen my book. I had to go back and get it out for her as she was sharing it. So our audience loves for our guests to tell them a little bit about yourself. So if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself to the Generation Youth guests, our, our community. Yeah, I'd love to do that. You know, not too long ago, I was picking up my youngest son from school and he, I overheard him telling a friend, my mom is a famous nurse. And his friend says, oh yeah, how do you know that? And he said, I asked Alexa, which is currently the standard of fame. And it's true. If you look online, you'll see all of the accomplishments I've been blessed to have in nursing, but that is not where I started. I started as a girl with broken family relationships and a generational dysfunction related to addiction. I started as the first woman in my family to ever go to a university mm -hmm. and to get a university degree. I was a very timid community college student and not a very good one. And I started as a mom with a lot of insecurity Securities related to that, just feeling like here I was an emerging pediatric nurse practitioner, but feeling like a failure behind closed doors, feeling like mm. I'm coaching other parents about their kids and I cannot manage my own. And that all culminated one day when my young, my oldest daughter was 13 at the time and we were driving down the road and she literally threw a book at my head from the back seat while we were driving. And it was just a wake up call for me that I needed to deal with the trauma of my past and I needed a new mindset and a new skill set going forward. And that has started really a 10 year journey of learning what it means to be resilient from trauma, even when we experience things that impact our parenting and that you can teach an old dog new tricks. You know, I can learn how to be a better parent. And now I've got, I'm married to a rocket scientist who's amused at the perception that people think I'm the smart one in the relationship. And we have four kids. They're now 20, 18, 16, and 14. And we live in Houston and we are just loving our life and wanting to share the hope that we have found with other people, with other families. Well, what was the catalyst behind writing behind closed doors? Well, there were a lot of things that led up to that moment, but, you know, starting at the beginning of the pandemic, I was in my backyard really seeing the landscape. I knew what was already approaching teenagers and had seen that my clinical practice had completely transformed. I really didn't even recognize pediatric practice on a daily basis compared to what it had been 20 years before. And then you enter COVID and all of the things that were going to happen. And I knew what was on the horizon. I saw the storm clouds gathering and I knew that parents were going to need some help and some hope. And I felt like that's where Dr. Nurse Mama, my online persona was born is my professor brain, my hands-on nursing experience and my heart as a mom, really being in the trenches alongside these other parents to be able to offer practical tools to real families with real needs in real time. Wow. You, you said your oldest is 20? Yes, that's right. I have a 20-year-old as well. And and uh, if they were like mine, they were a junior uh, when 2020 hit. Yeah. And that really, that I feel like that particular age was hit extremely hard because it was the tail end of their junior year. I don't know how it was. It maybe have been a little bit more open where you were at, but here in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, his senior year was really a hybrid of virtual versus just a touch of being in school. And so he lost a lot of that senior uh, 
experience and, and it's it didn't set him back some on that. Did you see that with some of the people you were working with as well? Oh, absolutely. And even in my own house. And one day my daughter, she told me she was sitting there thinking and she said, you know, mom, everything you've ever prepared me for, for this year in my life and for this transition is not true. And she was right. I mean, there was no mm -hmm. SAT. She didn't, who cared about SAT scores? I've been telling her about SAT scores for four years. Mm -hmm. There was no graduation. There was no prom. We didn't know if there was going to be any college, if she was going to be able to go. And, you know, I looked at my kids and by that time, I really, you know, people call me the teen whisperer. Like I know how to talk to teens. I know how to coach them on their feelings. And in my house, even having all of the privileges that my teens had, man, they were struggling. They were isolated. They were anxious. They were depressed. And I thought how much more so are other teens who maybe don't have access to the resources that my kids do. I mean, this is, this is bad. This is really bad. I, I agree. I saw that it was really bad on that generator. There are so many things. I, I taught high school for a decade, and there's so many things that teachers don't really, they're not consciously doing. It's not like there's a checklist. Okay, they're moving from junior to senior year. Let's do all these things. But we talk differently as they start to move in their senior year. We, we give them different responsibilities. There's different things we expect on them. There are little bitty activities that happen during little bitty. Boy, that sounds Southern uh, <laughs> activities. <laughs> the activities that happen during this, during the year that, you know, like senior parking day or senior pictures, none of that happened yeah. in it. And it was those little things that prepare them for that transition that I really think had a traumatic impact on their mental health. And that's one of the first topics and issues that you examine in your book. So let's dive in on that. What are you seeing? I love the fact that in your in each chapter, there's three different doors that you talk about. So let's go through each door on, on mental health, if you would share a little bit about those. I'd love to do that. And first, I feel like I have to say it's all right to be itty bitty. You know, <laughs> I'm Southern. <laughs> I think about Alan Jackson's song and you're making me think about that. <laughs> But talking about mental health, you know, a, a lot of times where I'm going doing media interviews, everyone is asking me the same question because they've seen the American Academy of Pediatrics, along with other organizations, declare a national crisis on mental mm -hmm. health. And people are asking me the question, is it really that bad? Is it as bad as people say it is? And I'm a nurse. We're the most trusted profession. So it's important to me to give very trustworthy advice. And I say, no, it's not as bad as people are saying it is. It is infinitely worse. You cannot imagine what it is like to live as a digital native at the speed of a smartphone. We don't understand that. Even though we had a little technology growing up, we did not have all of the world's bad news coming to us in just moments. We did not have an algorithm that was powered by psychologists, the best psychologists in the world who are employed to keep us addicted to a platform. Mm -hmm. And as we absorb one piece of bad news, it feeds us bad piece after bad news, after bad news, after bad news, until all of a sudden we don't even realize it shaped our worldview to think that the world is bad. We didn't grow up in a world where our lives could be changed in a second by a video taken of us without our consent or knowledge that goes viral. And whereas we experienced humiliation in a lunchroom, you know, with the bully stealing our lunch money, these kids experience humiliation on a global scale where viral videos can go in front of millions to see their humiliation. And that is a scary place. This is also the first generation that was born and has grown up post 9-11. They see the world as inherently unsafe. And then you enter all of the global conflict, all of the national unrest that we have, and then COVID, and it is just like a perfect storm. The other difference is that sentinel events in previous generations. You think about if you are a greatest generation, you know where you were on Mm -hmm. VE day. Uh, as a baby boomer, you know where you were when JFK was shot. As a Gen X, you know where you were when the Challenger exploded. And even as a millennial, you know where you were on 9-11. 
all of those events catalyzed the world together. They brought the world together. They, there was a sense of unity, a sense of pride and patriotism. COVID has completely torn the world apart and we have a more polarized public than we ever have before. And this is where our teens are growing up in that shadow. So yes, of course, they're having a mental health crisis. It should be surprising to no one. But they're just reacting really to the world that we've given them. Uh, We've given them a world that we anticipated because of the inventions and the technology and the things we we anticipated being such a great gift to younger generations, but we didn't anticipate what was happening. We didn't know how to handle it. So we weren't able to teach them. And so we're playing back catch up to this trauma that we've, we've caused upon them. And it's, it's really, really stressing not only their generation, but, but older generations as well, as they're trying to deal with this as, as well. Well, there's hope in that too, though, because I think as parents, We have very little tolerance, first of all, for long-term problems. We want everything to be fixed right away. We want to be like a little virtual assistant, you know, Mm -hmm. where our kids come to us and say, I'm having this problem. And we say, oh, thank you for your inquiry. Have you tried this? Okay, good. Is there anything else I can help you with? Bye-bye. That's how we want to do it. Or we want to treat parenting like Chia pets when that's not the case. These things are problems that we cannot fix. We also want to, we want to fix everything if we're honest. And we cannot fix a world that is so inherently broken. But the hope in all of this is that we actually, as a pediatric community, we know a lot about resilience to trauma. We've been studying this for a long, long time. And the number one predictor of resilience to a trauma is a kid having a meaningful connection to an adult in their life, Mm -hmm. to a healthy relationship with an adult. So they don't want us to be perfect parents who fix everything. They want us to be present parents who are just there and walk them through and bear witness to what they're experiencing and give those messages of hope that you are loved, you are special, you can do this, I believe in you. That's really what they need. And we're trying to make it something much more complex than it is, but that's the simple thing. Now, the rub in all of that is that it takes our most valuable commodity, and that is our time. And so that's really difficult. You know, we want something that's a quicker fix, something that doesn't take as much as our, of our time. But this takes hours of conversation, of just sitting and being together in the same room and intentionally investing in building healthy relationships. But it is an investment that pays off dividends in future generations, even down to the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Mr. Ziegler, the late Mr. Ziegler said that children spell love T-I-M-E. So when you said that, it kind of resonated with me uh, so greatly as as it's going through. So parents sitting there and they're like, I want to be, I want to have a meaningful connection with my time. Give me, give me, you're saying time. I want a tip. You know, everybody's lit that lists these things. They want, they want something they can jot down, uh, take a note on and be able to do step one on. And I know that's not always the case, but if we could give them a starting point, what would you suggest? I will give them four easy steps to improve communication with your teen. And if you do this over time, I promise you that in six months, when you look back, you will have a completely different relationship. So what I did in my book, Behind Closed Doors, was I translated a professional model called motivational interviewing. It's how we talk to teens. I translated that into an easier to access method for parents. And it's called Love Your Team, L O V E. Those are the four steps. So I'll you run through the notes. Really- you read oh, my notes, good. and I was going to ask you about. <laughs> so great, you I love that. Team. Good. So L, listen with your face. So often we lead with lecturing, but you cannot lecture your way to leverage behavioral change. You cannot argue Mm -hmm. your way into right relationship. And so we need to close our mouths and listen. We have two ears and one mouth. We need to listen twice as much as we speak and listen with your face. Uh, When you don't, there's a phenomenon that we're studying in science called fubbing, P-H-U-B-B-I-N-G. It's phone snubbing. And we live with 
with our faces in a screen and we say, yeah, I'm listening, I'm listening, but we're so busy. And when we don't make eye contact, our teens don't have a brain reaction that happens when we make eye contact for 20 seconds or more. Their brains actually secrete feel good chemicals that make them feel bonded to us. God designed us that way. And so we need to make eye contact and listen with our face. Step two, offer open ended questions. So instead of, again, leading with lecturing, we ask questions, just genuine open ended questions. Just how does that make you feel? What's the hardest part of the situation for you? How do you see this playing out? You know, what do you think you're going to do? What do you think is going to happen? Just cultivate curiosity and asking questions, allow them to tiptoe out on that relational bridge that you're making till they feel safe. Step three is V validate their emotions. So you can validate their emotions without agreeing with anything that's going on. Just simply saying something like, this seems really hard for you. I can see you're really stressed. I can see you're upset. I can see that this is making you really sad. That will make them feel seen in a way that is just extremely valuable. Step four, E, and that's explore next steps together. So once you've given them listening, once you've asked some questions and cultivating curiosity, once you've validated their emotions, then you can start to offer your advice and say, okay, here's you know what I think. Can I share with you what I think you know might be helpful to you in this situation? Or can I share with you an experience that I had. Kids love to hear about our own experiences. It really humanizes us and makes us feel like we're not, you know, ancient and we do understand and we were young once upon a time. But after you've built that relational bridge, then that can be a meaningful way to move forward. How how long did it or how did you go from being the the mom who had the dodged the book to to you know, what was that journey like? Because I, I was thinking that when you were telling this and, and you were sharing with this, there's a somebody's listening with this right now and said, a book, I got shoes thrown at me. I got everything thrown at me. How do I, how do I start? How do I get to this point? Uh, so well, how, how did that happen? You have to, well, the first thing you have to do is realize that you can't continue to do the same thing and expect different mm -hmm. results. I mean, that's the definition of insanity, right? And some of us can feel literally insane, just pulling our hair out, just trying over and over the same thing. So you, the first thing that you have to do is recognize that you need a new mindset and a new skill set going forward. The second thing that you have to do is address your own trauma, because what that does is it projects a view of how we don't even realize the subtle ways that we look at our kids and project our trauma response onto them, which they may or may not have. And so often when we have a problem with our kid, we think, okay, tell me how to fix my kid. Well, you can't fix your kid without fixing yourself first. Right. And so an honest look at your life thinking, is there something in my past I haven't dealt with? Do I need to go to counseling? Do I need to talk to somebody about this? How can I get help for that hurt that I've had for so long? That's really, really hard. So once you start doing that, step three is modeling those healthy behaviors because what we see our kids having the behaviors that they exhibit, they're caught, they're not taught. So they're going to do what we do, not what we say. And so if they see us having healthier coping mechanisms for stress or for trauma or for whatever hardship that we're dealing with, they will adopt those. And the last thing is to be patient and know that this is not a linear journey. This is not, okay, I'm going to get better. And one day I'm going to arrive at that destination and I'm going to be the perfect mom. And you know, then I'll be happy. That is not true. This is a looping back and forth kind of journey with you know, great victories and great setbacks. And we have to give ourselves grace and space to take big transitions and small steps. And really the point that you know that you've arrived is when you recognize that that mysterious, mystical happiness that you're looking for does not happen when you arrive at some destination that's unknown. It arrives when you learn to find joy in the journey.
and you realize that it's all about the journey along the way and the conversations and the relationship you build. And it makes the destination really irrelevant. That's not what people want to hear, but it's the truth. Well, a lot of times people want a quick fix for their child right now. And yeah. as Andy Andrews says, you're not raising children, you're raising future adults. And we have to have a larger perspective of this and think about the fact that if we consider them leaving the home, hopefully around 18, 19 to become their own selves, that's only 18 years out of, out of, you know, what, that's a fourth of their life or fifth of their life, maybe a fourth on average. You will parent them. If God tarries with you, for you to live this long, you will parent them a lot, be the parent of them a lot longer as an adult than you will as a child. So one of the things that, that my wife and I've often thought about is, are we raising someone that we want to be a friend with when they're in their 30s and 40s uh, versus someone right now as a you know 16 year old? Because ours are 23, 20 and 13. So we're we're kind of <laughs> You're all right the there. We're right there together. And I think it's important to have the perspective, too, that you want to raise them to be healthy adults and healthy mm -hmm. adults are not perfect. We Healthy relationships aren't perfect perfect. There are going to be mistakes. They're going to mess up. We are going to mess up. They're going to hurt somebody's feelings. They're going to make a decision you don't wish that they have. But is there a path to recovery in that? Is there grace? Is there restoration? Mm -hmm. Is there a path for resilience? That's the important thing. And even today, I'll tell you, I still mess up. You know, my kids and I still have conflict. I have bad days where I have to go back to them and say, I am so sorry. I was not at my best today. I was really struggling and I spoke very sharply and I said things I didn't mean. Will you please forgive me? And when you have the cushion of that healthy relationship, they'll say, yeah, of course. And then you extend that back to them. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the issues that kind of stem out of, of the mental health crisis is, is suicide that we we're seeing, uh, new numbers come out, you know, the CDC came out with their studies that they did during COVID. And the first time they released it in, in 2022, that it was almost like, I think it was 19.1% has said that they had contemplated suicide during sometime during 21. Uh, that's an extremely high number uh, for an average classroom size in North Carolina in our area is around 20. That means there were almost five, four to five kids in that room. If you look at it from that perspective on there, why, why is, why are we in this position that what suicide's always been an issue? I mean, I am, I'm in my early fifties and I remember after school specials. I don't think our audience, some of our audience might not remember that, but they had after school specials that were dealing with these topics in the eighties uh, on these in, in movies about it in songs, uh, even in the 70s, there were songs about, about suicide. So it's always been an issue that's out there, but it seems more prevalent now. Why are we seeing this rise? Well, you're right. And all of those statistics being sobering and suicide used to be something I saw occasionally when I first started in pediatrics 25 years ago. But now I'll tell you, I see it every single day. And it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. When kids are starting to face things that they, they start to become more afraid of living than they are of dying. Dying seems like a less scary way out. And some of the really sobering statistics that I see are that more than half of kids who make in a suicide attempt, they make that decision within 15 minutes or less of trying that attempt. Kids wow. are wired to be really impulsive and they see these things happening on social media. Suicide contagion is a phenomenon that's yeah. very real. And so they see other kids who are doing it and they think, oh, they really think you know, someone doesn't want to put up with me. My parents shouldn't have to put up with this problem. This I'm a burden to everyone. And they start to listen to this internal narrative of lies and then they have easy access to means and methods. So this is something that really parents have to talk about. You can't be afraid to talk about it. You're not going to give them ideas that weren't there already before. The other thing we know from research Gosh, that is, is that is so important. Repeat that again, because that, that, I, I, 
if there's one thing that the audience can take away, it's what you just said. So if you wouldn't mind repeating that, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that was great. No, that's okay. I'm happy to say it again. Don't be afraid to ask about suicide or to talk about it openly. You will not give a kid any ideas that were not there before. Research supports this completely. And in fact, we know that kids who attempt suicide, most of them have seen a healthcare provider or had some sort of outcry in the weeks preceding that. They want to say something, but there's so much shame and stigma surrounding suicide. And we can think about this as parents and people who invest in young people and the way that we talk about suicide that happens in our community. And we perpetuate shame and stigma by saying things like even committing suicide, like committing a crime. We should just say they died by suicide. Or the first question out of anybody's mouth is usually, how did they do it? We have this morbid curiosity, but we know that talking about method increases the likelihood of contagion and mimicking that behavior. And really? Seeing I didn't know that. Death. It does. And so not talking about method is really important. Focusing on the loss is important. Or we say, well, that's a shame, but you know, like her mother's crazy or, you know, they were having financial problems or, you know, her parents are divorced and like that was just a terrible situation. And we, we make these excuses because stigma is social rejection. When we hear about something awful that's happened, this kind of goes to the the American public's uh, obsession with crime podcast right? Because we want to find that one thing that's different that would make us safe. Oh, I would never do that. Oh, I would never go there. Oh, that would never happen to me. And that's what we're looking for. So even when suicide happens in our community saying, I'm so sorry this happened. This is a terrible tragedy. How are you feeling about it? How can I help support you in processing your emotions? That tells them, hey, they care. You know, this person cares and this is someone I can go. So let me just walk through really quickly what should happen, what you should talk to your kids about. If their friends make any mention of suicide, even if it's a joke, that conversation should come to a full stop and just say, are you thinking about killing yourself? Oh, that sounds so uncomfortable. You know, we don't want to say that because we think, oh, is that okay? Is that offensive? You know, is that going to give them ideas? No, just say, are you thinking about that? And if they say yes, the question that should immediately follow is, do you have a plan? And if they say, yes, I have a plan, that is a full on emergency. Kids need to go find an adult. An adult needs to find a healthcare professional. You need to go to the emergency room. You need to call 911. You need to call your mental health care provider if you already have one. They need emergency connection to services. Wow. If the answer is no, I don't have a plan, then that is not emergent, but it is urgent. You need to tell an adult right away. You need to go to a healthcare provider right away. And they can help you put a safety plan in place called, we call it means reduction, just making sure they don't have access to a gun. Because unfortunately, and sadly, and tragically, almost 70% of teen suicides occur by firearm. It's almost always fatal. So that's something that we want to make sure that they don't have access to that, that they're being you know, supported, that they have observation, that they have close adults by that are waiting with them through that, through that really tough time right there. But it is, I cannot say it enough. It's really important to talk about it. And now we have a national suicide hotline. You know, everyone knows to call 911 in an emergency, but now there's a hotline called uh, the suicide hotline. Line at, at that is 988. That is the number, just dialing 988. So I tell teens, save this as a contact in your phone. And if you're worried about a friend, just say, share that contact with them and say, hey, I want you to have access to this. If you're ever feeling desperate or lonely or you don't know who to call, here's another emergency resource that you can have. And you never know how many lives that could save. I, I feel like there's a parent or an adult listening to that's like, how do I know? How, how, what are some signs that I can see? Um, it's really hard. Because in, sometimes, yeah, sometimes there are. Well, no I was going to say in the last year that we had an instance like this, and the result, the things that I heard from teachers and and the people around it, I didn't hear it from the parents. Where we never had a clue. We never had a clue that there was any issues. And I'm like, I didn't know the family. I didn't know the situation. I'm like, well, 
maybe we, we, that's some education we need to provide on the front end to some parents. So how, how do they know? Sometimes it's hard because it, there is so much shame and stigma that it's hidden, you know, and, and I mm-hmm. would say to any person who is listening, who has been impacted by suicide, as I have very personally on a personal level, it was not your fault. What happened is not your fault. And there's a lot of guilt that goes on, you know, looking back, thinking, what could I have seen? And we have to know that we do the best we can with what we know. And then when we know more, we do better. That's the best that we can do. But sometimes there are signs there. You go back and you look and you think, oh, I I did see that. Oh, maybe I should have asked there. And you can't beat yourself up about that. You just absolutely can't. But a lot of times we just kind of have this feeling like something is wrong, but I'm not sure what, like maybe you seem more withdrawn. Maybe you're not as active. You're telling me no to my you know invitations to join us for a social gathering. You seem mm. depressed. You seem anxious. Just that spidey sense that something is just off. So just asking that question plainly, just say, hey, I see that something is off. I want to make sure that you feel okay. Is there anything you need to tell me? And this may be a really awkward question, but I just need to ask, are you thinking about harming yourself or killing yourself? And, you know, they may say, oh, no, 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 I'm not. And say, okay, well, if you are, I just want you to know I'm a safe person that you can always tell me anything. And that's really important just to make sure that they know that that door to communication is open. That is so significant. You just mentioned uh, in there too about harming themselves. Is that a, a sign as well? If they're cutting, doing so, is that a precursor to that? It can be. So harming, self-harming is usually just a physical way to deal with emotional pain. And so you may see signs of that. That may be one thing that, that you see. And so it's important to say that, say, I see signs because a lot of times they'll deny it at first and just say, I can see that. I really want to get you some help. So having the courage to go to a healthcare provider who is equipped to be able to assess Mm -hmm. the situation and tell you if your concern should be moderate or mild or significant, they can tell you that. Now, as parents, we did this all the time. When our kids were little, they pulled on their ears just a little bit or they're fussy. We take them in and say, hey, I want you just to make sure their ears are okay. We need to have that same kind of attitude with mental health. Just something's off. They're a little off. I just want you to make sure that everything's okay. Parents are afraid of that because they don't want their kids to be labeled or to have a prescription shoved in their face. And those are not the things that should happen. I mean, the, the frontline therapy for anxiety and depression is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is just a, a way of counseling people. And that should be the first thing that happens. But just knowing what you need to do, your primary health care provider is going to be best equipped to help you to navigate that. Wow, what, what great insight and advice uh, for this audience as we go through some very, very difficult in, in, uh, issues. And you tackle so many of them during this book. I highly, I highly recommend this. And I love the fact that, that you talk about it from your professional perspective, uh, from a mom perspective, and from your faith uh, perspective as well. Um, share how each chapter is laid out real quick with, with our group so that they can get excited and buy this book. I would love for you to do that. I have to give those listening a disclaimer. This is not just, oh, read and have your perspective shifted. This is a Jumanji style parenting adventure. Like you got to roll up your sleeves. You got to get your hands dirty. Your feelings are Is it Dwayne Johnson Jumanji or the Robin Williams Jumanji? We got to specify it now. I know, really, truly. I mean, I'm thinking we're at the level of the rock here. I mean, it is, it's pretty <laughs> intense, right? But the investment is so worthwhile. So very quickly, uh, each chapter, I cover the top 12 things that I see in pediatric practice. That includes mental health, social media, cyberbullying, suicide, gender identity, social justice, eating disorders, divorce, substance abuse, pornography, you know, just all of those <laughs> run-of-the-mill mm-hmm. things that nobody wants to talk about, right? Right, but our kids 
are talking about those. And we have the amazing privilege of initiating conversation to equip with them to feel confident about navigating that cultural current. So each chapter is laid out in three sections. I take you behind three doors. Behind closed doors, we go behind three doors. First, I take you right behind my clinic door. I give you real stories of real families with real problems in real time. Like for example, how does a kid who's sexting end up in my clinic? My appointment schedule doesn't say, oh, they're depressed because they're sexting. It says they have a headache. They're not sleeping well. Mom wants to make sure they don't have the flu. That's what it says. So how does that connection happen? And I give you the health impacts and what I would tell your teenager behind that closed door of the clinic to demystify and destigmatize that healthcare visit. The second door is behind the home door. So I take those conversations that we have behind the clinic and translate them to home strategies, really kind of choose your own ending as specific activities that you can engage with in your, with your kids, specific questions that you can ask specific conversation prompts that you can start all using that love your team model. And then the third door behind the heart door, because the truth is when we look at the reality of what kids are facing today, it makes the strongest heart hurt. I mean, these are heavy topics that should be handled with care. So I really want to take care of the parent's heart as they're reading this and make sure that you leave not feeling depressed and discouraged, but feeling empowered and hopeful that you can build healthy relationships. So there's devotionals, there's scriptures, there's prayer lists, there's a playlist, uh, there's all kinds of resources. I, I was very impressed when I got to the back and saw the appendix where it talked about the play. I was like, wow, this is really cool. And my wife, uh, being a worship leader and, and musician, she really got into that. I uh, really loved that as well. So, And I'll, sh- I'll give a shout out too to each chapter. I love the, the last, one of the last things you did in your chapter was a, a section called ACT. Because um, I love activities that you can engage in that, that, reinforce you know what you're teaching so folks stay with the chapters until the end because you want to be you know if you're going to do anything go to the end and read that chapter if you that session because that was those are really practical and and impactful um, well i'd love to share you know at the end you're right i i have also have an activity called legacy letters where i challenge parents mm-hmm. to write letter because so much communication today for teens is digital and disposable. It's just designed to disappear and they don't value communication like we did, but they do value vintage, uh, vintage culture, which is so terrible for all of us because we're talking vintages, handwritten <laughs> notes or pagers or, you know, rotary telephones. So having something- Or even a post-it like- note. Exactly. That's vintage. Oh, it's so sad. But I did have one parent who contacted me who took the challenge that I gave in the divorce chapter. And this particular legacy letter was to write a letter to your child affirming the qualities that they got from their other parent, from the divorced parent. And this mom wrote to me and she said, I knew I needed to do this, but it was going to be really, really hard. But she wrote a letter to her son and just said, these are the qualities you got from your dad that I really uh, like and admire and appreciate. I still, I still can't hardly tell this story without getting emotional. She said her, she put it on her son's bed. He didn't say anything to her, but two weeks later he came back and he said, you know, I really thought that you hated my dad and I'm half my dad. And so because you hated my dad, you hated half of me. And I hated all of me. And he said, but this letter has really given me hope. And he shared that he was even to the point of being suicidal. But that letter, you know, it didn't automatically cure everything, but it gave them a starting place. It gave them an opening to start a healing journey. And I can't even imagine, you know, all the impact that could be if we would just intentionally invest in building that generational legacy. Wow. That's that's a pretty powerful way to to kind of wrap this uh, time here up. Uh, how can our Jessica? How can our audience connect with you more to find out more about what you do to learn uh, some of the things that you have to offer? Uh, where can they go to see you? 
Well, you can pick up the book Behind Closed Doors at any anywhere books are sold. It's on Amazon, but it's also at any major book retailer. You can find me at drnursemama.com. That's drnursemama, M-A-M-A.com. Uh, I have a podcast that is uh, explores health impacts and home strategies. We talk about all of these really tough issues. How do you have comfortable conversations about uncomfortable things. And that is with American Family Radio. So you can find the Dr. Nurse Mama podcast, any platform that pod, you listen to podcasts and I hang out on social media. You can find me at Facebook and Instagram at Dr. Nurse Mama. And that look, you need to follow her on Instagram because they, they have great content because that's where I found you out on great content. Your podcast, it downloads on Mondays. Is that correct? That's right. Every Monday it downloads. Yep. And even just in the first three months, we had more than 50,000 downloads and it is growing exponentially every week. So I'm so happy to welcome parents to the table who are just looking for hope and talking about things that really people aren't talking about, but we, we can talk about them in a way that's comfortable and that gives you hope for healthy relationships. I feel like this has uh, been providentially brought together because there's just so much synergy between between yeah. what you're saying and, and what we believe. So I, I feel like this is not the ending of, of, of maybe us uh, talking and, and conversing over time. But thank you so much uh, for your for your impact in our summit and for being with me today. I, I just I just so appreciate you and, and I appreciate your time today. Well, I'm hearing the last line of Casablanca, you know, start to play uh, for sure. <laughs> just the beginning, right? But I always love to end with a blessing for those listening. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you peace. And to our audience, if you've stuck with us, you've found great value in what you're hearing. And someone you know needs to hear this message. So please like and share and comment on this. And we'll see you again next week on the Generation Youth Podcast.